developing the trading as well as the purely financial side of it. All the members of the family were actively engaged in it, and Rothschild's unmarried daughter sat at the cash desk, assisted by the wives of Solomon and Amal. Meanwhile the fifth son, Jacob, generally called James, had reached the age of sixteen, and like his elder brothers had begun to take an active part in the business. This had made it possible for the eldest son Emil also to leave Frankfurt fairly often, in order, like Karl, who was the firm's traveller, to visit the elector in Bohemia. Budarus in the meantime had arranged that the elector's cash income, which it was really his duty to administer, should be collected by Rothschild and remain in his hands at 4% interest. Thus, during the summer of 1808 he received 223,800 gulden against bills at 4% a very respectable sum at a time when ready money was so scarce, and the elector was reluctant to leave it all with him. However he found in due course that Rothschild accounted with extreme accuracy for every penny of it. In accordance with the wishes of Emperor Francis, the elector moved to Prague toward the end of August, 1808. That monarch knew well what he was doing in welcoming the elector to his territories. Austria was chronically in need of money. Nevertheless plans were being made to avenge her defeat. Count Stadion especially was the prime mover in the idea of waging a new war against the insolent Emperor of the French. Financial affairs in Austria were in a state of chaos, as revealed by the Vienna Bourse of the period. A confidential friend of Emperor Francis had sent him a report on the subject in which he did not mince his words. I feel it my duty to observe, he wrote that the bourse at the present time seems more like a jumble sale than an imperial bourse. The dregs and scourings of the population invade it, and decent businessmen, capable of handling such matters, are pushed into the background and shouted down, so that reasonable discussion becomes impossible. Closer investigation will reveal the fact that many of these people are paid by stock jobbers, systematically to create disorder at the bourse. The collapse in the value of the paper currency, the violent fluctuations in all quotations, the fear of war and the general unrest all contributed to this state of affairs. It was in vain for Emperor Francis to resolve that measures must be taken to prevent the bourse from degenerating into a rowdy collection of persons of no position who sacrifice all considerations to the basest greed for profit. The fundamental cause of these conditions remained unaltered. The Austrian state hoped for some financial assistance from the elector at Prague. He was living a retired life at the Palace Liechtenstein, and Vienna set itself to discover the state of the elector's purse. All kinds of confidential persons and secret agents of the police, some of them disguised under titles of nobility and wearing officers' uniforms, were sent to Prague. One of them reported that the elector of Hesse had large sums at his disposal, and was in communication with particulars through middlemen, regarding the purchase of state obligations. He stated that it was not at all unlikely that a loan to the imperial court could be obtained under favourable conditions, and suggested that it might be worthwhile to make inquiries on this matter through confidential bankers and exchange merchants. Immediately on receipt of this report, the emperor with quite unwanted promptitude instructed the Chancellor of the Exchequer Count O'Donnell to let him have his opinion as speedily as possible on this report received from a trustworthy source. We now for the first time find the name of Rothschild mentioned in connection with the Austrian court. Count O'Donnell reported that there was no doubt that the elector had rescued considerable sums and also had large amounts to his credit in England, and that it was therefore worth attempting to induce him to subscribe to a loan either in solid gold, or in reliable bills of exchange on places abroad. The Count emphasized that in order to achieve this object the best method would probably be to approach the middlemen to whom the elector entrusts his financial affairs, and this can best be done through a reliable exchange office in Vienna or Prague. O'Donnell recommended that such middlemen should receive one, two, or three percent commission, this being in any case customary in such proceedings, and they would then have an interest in stimulating the elector to carry through the transaction. The papers of the Credits Commission reveal, the Count's report continued, that the persons who appeared on behalf of the elector, then Landrave, in connection with the negotiation of the loan of 1,200,000 gulden in 1796 were the Frankfurt firm Rippel and Harnia, and Privy Councillor Budarus. At that time the interest on these loans 
was collected by the local firm Frank & Company, on behalf of the Jewish firm at Frankfurt of Mayor Emil Rothschild, who were authorized to collect them by a power of attorney executed by Privy Councillor Buderus, and it appears to me abundantly evident that this Privy Councillor is the principal person who should be moved, through some advantage, to smooth our path. It was decided to put up to the intermediaries two proposals, either that they should obtain a 5% loan on mortgage security, or that they should persuade the elector to invest a considerable sum, at least one or two million, in the lottery loan. Hereupon the following resolution was issued by His Imperial Majesty, in view of the indubitable necessity for providing if possible for the collection in hard cash of an adequate supply of money I approve of an attempt being made to obtain a cash loan from the elector of Hesse. The important thing is to make use of a reliable and intelligent mediator who may be relied upon to carry through the negotiations cautiously and skillfully, so as to achieve the desired end on the most favorable terms possible. In accordance with these instructions Buderus and Rothschild were confidentially approached as mediators, and they promised that they would do their best, but they emphasized the fact that the ultimate decision lay solely with the elector. They at once duly informed the elector of the Napoleonic era six dollars of the wishes of Austria, but he showed a reluctance to meet them, and then war broke out and the negotiations were postponed. During the period which followed the elector, regarding whose avarice and enormous wealth the most varied stories were spread at Prague, was closely watched by secret police specially sent from Vienna. He took an active interest in current affairs, and closely followed the powerful movement which was developing in Germany particularly in Prussia, its aim being to shake off the foreign yoke. This movement could not as yet come into the open, but in Königsberg, where the king and the government of Prussia were residing, the Tugendbund was formed, a league which ostensibly pursued moral scientific aims, but the ultimate object of which was deliverance of Germany. The principal protector of the league was the minister Baron von Stein, and William of Hesse held an important position in it. Its membership was so wide that it also included Jews, and the Rothschilds appear to have become members. At any rate they acted as go-betweens for the elector's correspondence on this matter, and made payments in favor of the Tugendbund. Through an intercepted letter from Stein which mentioned the elector, Napoleon learned of the desire for a war of revenge, and of the plans for a rising in Hesse. Stein had to flee, and Napoleon's distrust of the elector and of his servants was very much increased. The emperor saw clearly that the elector was implicated, that is, was financing it. Further intercepted letters confirmed this view. As a result several businessmen mentioned in them by the elector were arrested. It was desired through them to obtain further information regarding the apparently inexhaustible resources of the elector. Amongst these men of business Buderus was prominent, and it was particularly desired to ascertain his precise connection with the bankers. One of these was Mayor Emil Rothschild, whose relations with Buderus had long been no secret to the French officials. The Frankfurt banker was accordingly cited to appear before the Chancery of the Urban and District of Frankfurt on August 13, 1808. But he could not obey his summons since he was confined to his bed. He had fallen seriously ill in June, 1808, had been operated on by a professor from Mainz, and, fearing that his days were numbered, he had made his will. He therefore sent his son Solomon to appear in his place, telling him not to let himself be drawn, and to make only such statements as were not likely to furnish the French with any clue, or else to provide false clues. Solomon carried out his mission with great skill. The French were but little enlightened by the cross-examination, and in the end they dismissed the young Jew with the order that he should immediately hand over to the court any letter from Budchris to the firm of Rothschild. Buderus and Lent were themselves arrested in September, 1808, and minutely examined for several days at Mainz, this being only natural in view of the fact that these men, who were the elector's tools, were in the power of the French at Frankfurt, whereas their chief was living in Prague, out of Napoleon's reach. Napoleon's mistrust of William was fully justified, for in October, 1808, the elector was carrying on negotiations at Prague for promoting insurrections throughout the whole of the northwest of Germany, with the view that they should spread to the south as well. This matter was certainly carried on with great secrecy. Even the Austrian secret police agents knew only in a general way that something was in the wind. 
it is amusing to note the naive manner in which they arrived at the conclusions contained in their reports. The Elector of Hesse, says one of these reports, has forty-one natural sons, all of whom he is decently provided for, but as the fall of the Elector has disappointed their hopes of a brilliant career, they are endeavouring to reinstate their father. As the defeat of Prussia has deprived them of all chance of achieving their object by force, they have had recourse to a secret association which is intended to extend its activities throughout the whole of Germany under the protection of the English Masonic Lodge at Hanover. This league will take a suitable opportunity to reveal itself in a public conspiracy in order to retain its final object. The probability of another war has aroused fresh expectations of making proselytes, in small confidential circles something is occasionally said about the possibility of putting an end to the miseries of the country by putting Napoleon and his brothers out of the way. Vienna, however, was not merely interested in the elector's high politics. Further information was also desired as to his financial advisers, particularly as to Rothschild, mentioned by O'Donnell. Urgent instructions were therefore sent to the chief of police of the city of Prague to obtain as accurate information as possible regarding that man's activities. The chief of police reported, Amsel Mayer Rothschild, living under the registered number 184 in the third main district, is agent for war payments to the elector of Hesse, and in that capacity he has achieved mention, together with his brother, Moses Mayer Rothschild, in the electoral almanac for the year 1806. The father of these two men appears in the almanac as a war pay master. According to information supplied by Major von Thummel, Amsel Mayer Rothschild, has come here from Frankfurt, where he has been living hitherto, in order to look after the elector's financial affairs, which were formerly entrusted to Balavum, who seems to have shown a certain lack of diligence. Be that as it may, we may assume that Amsel Mayer Rothschild renders the elector important services in other matters too and it is not entirely improbable that this Jew is at the head of an important propaganda system in favour of the elector, whose branches extend throughout the former Hessian territories. I have reasons for this opinion. These suppositions are based on the following fact, whenever I enter the elector's quarters, I always find Rothschild there, and generally in the company of Army Councillor Schmink and War Secretary Natz, and they go into their own rooms, and Rothschild generally has papers with him. We may assume that their aims are in no sense hostile to Austria, since the elector is exceedingly anxious to recover the possession of his electorate, so that it is scarcely open to question that the organizations and associations, whose guiding spirit Rothschild probably is, are entirely concerned with the popular reactions and the other measures to be adopted, if Austria should have the good fortune to make any progress against France and Germany. Owing to his extensive business connections it is probable that he can ascertain this more easily than anybody else, and can also conceal his machinations under the cloak of business. This report was more or less in accordance with the facts. For Rothschild was the connecting link between Budarus, who lived in Hesse and could never come to Fragile, and the elector. Rothschild was also constantly busy with the elector's financial affairs, and these were of a particularly wide scope at the beginning of 1809, since with the passage of time the accumulations of money in England, by way of interest and otherwise, had grown so large that their supervision required particular care. Budarus proposed that his master should acquire British securities at 3%, and suggested that Mayor Amel should he commissioned to effect the purchase of them. Rothschild had naturally made this proposal to Budarus in the first instance, and Budarus had duly put it forward as his own suggestion. The close relations between Budarus and Rothschild had at that time actually been embodied in a written agreement between them which virtually made the electoral official a secret partner in the firm of Rothschild. This highly important document runs as follows. The following confidential agreement has today been concluded between the Privy War Councillor Budarus von Karlshausen, and the business house of Mayor Emil Rothschild at Frankfurt, whereas Budarus has handed over to the banking firm of Mayor Emil Rothschild the capital sum of 20,000 gulden, 24 florins, and has promised to advise that firm in all business matters to the best of his ability and to advance its interests as far as he may find practicable. The firm of Mayor Emil Rothschild promises to render Budarus a true account of the profits made in respect of the above-mentioned capital sum of 20,000 gulden, and to allow him access to all books at any time so that he may satisfy himself with regard to this provision. 
the agreement contained a provision for its termination on either side by giving six months notice. Budaris now had a personal interest in securing for Mayor Emil Rothschild a monopoly in the conduct of the elector's business. What he had done had been in the best interests of all concerned. His experience of a period of years had proved to him the reliability and the skill of the House of Rothschild. He harbored no prejudices against the Jews. And he was firmly convinced that the elector, his master, was bound to gain by placing his financial affairs in the hands of one firm, especially of such an able firm as the House of Rothschild. The Rothschilds on the other hand needed the support of a man who could gain for them the confidence of the suspicious and avaricious elector, who was an exceedingly difficult person to handle. They had achieved this object through Budarus, but they wanted to secure the relationship for the future, and therefore gave him a personal interest in the continued prosperity of the business. Finally Budarus himself profited by this arrangement as he fully deserved to do after the persevering and self-sacrificing efforts that he had made. And he could never hope that he would be regarded in accordance with his deserts by the rapacious elector. Moreover, he was far too scrupulous and honorable spontaneously to appropriate money in the course of his administration of the elector's property. But he had a very large family, and by becoming a secret partner in the firm of Rothschild he was enabled to meet its requirements. Budaris's efforts with his master were successful. The elector acted upon Rothschild's recommendations regarding British stocks, and he then actually ordered that £150,000 of the stocks should be purchased on his account, which in fact exceeded the amount that Budaris had suggested. The investment itself was entrusted to Rothschild. Up to this time the financial transactions in England had been the most reliable as far as interest payments were concerned. But the payments in respect of interest due from members of the English royal house came in at most irregular intervals and were often outstanding for very long periods. The elector, however, did not agitate to get these payments in, for he regarded the money laid out in this direction less as an investment than as a means of putting the members of the ruling house under an obligation to himself. The brothers Rothschild noted this practice of the elector with important personages. They had practical evidence, from the experience of their princely client, of the fact that transactions involving temporary loss may ultimately result in very good business. The debtors' uneasy feeling on failing to make payments at the date when they fell due sometimes led them to try to make amends in other ways, through furnishing valuable information or through political services and such favors often produced cash results far exceeding the amount actually owing. At this time the bond between the House of Rothschild and the Elector had become a very close one. And this was not due to Budaris only, but also to their loyalty. Although this quality resulted to their advantage, they incurred the risks that loyalty involved. The only really unpleasant circumstance in this connection was the fact that the frivolous heir to the Elector, who was always in need of money, exploited the situation and at every possible opportunity borrowed from his father's faithful Jewish servant. In any case that could not be a very serious matter, as Rothschild was morally certain to get his money back, the prince being the heir to the enormous fortune which his father had amassed. These large financial transactions did not put an end to the dealings in small antiques between the elector and Rothschild, which had been the starting point of their business relations. However, there was a difference. Their roles were reversed. The elector now sold to Rothschild vases, jewels and antique boxes, etc. more often than he bought them. These dealings constituted a peculiar bond of sympathy between the elector and his Jewish crown agent, and the elector enjoyed showing his talent in this field, as far as was consistent with his high birth. Meanwhile the relations between Austria and France had become more acute. The Emperor Napoleon had returned from Spain, and a new war between Napoleon and the Emperor Francis was imminent. The elector offered the Emperor a legion of 4,000 men, this offer being coupled with a touching appeal that the Emperor should secure his reinstatement in the rulership of his territories. The offer was thankfully accepted. On April 9, 1809, the Austrians crossed the inn. Thereupon Napoleon ceased to be a factor in the treatment accorded to the elector at Prague. The elector was granted the honours due to a sovereign, and society was commanded to call on his favourite at Prague, who until then had been very much slighted. They wanted to get on the right side of him in order to get as much money and as many troops from him as possible. 
the elector, however, put only one half of the promised forces in the field. That cost him 600,000 gulden. And it was Rothschild who saw to the collection and distribution of this sum. This work was full of danger for the Rothschilds as they were at the mercy of the French in Frankfurt. In spite of the great scarcity of money at the time it was Rothschild who from his own resources advanced to the elector the cash amount of several hundred thousand gulden required on short loan. The elector already saw himself in possession of his states. I come, he wrote somewhat prematurely in a proclamation of April, 1809, to loose your bonds. Austria's exalted monarch protects me and protects you. Let us hail the brave Austrians. They are our true friends and it is in their midst and with their assistance that I come to you. It was with eloquence rather than with cash that he called upon his Hessians to rise. When one of the local leaders wanted to seize Castle and take King Jerome prisoner, he applied to the elector in the first instance for financial support. All that he received, however, was a piece of paper, representing an order for thirty thousand thalers, payable only in the event of the rising being successful. When the attempt failed, the elector laid the blame, upon the premature and unprepared nature of the attack. The immediate result of the attempt was that the elector's servants in Hessian territory were subjected to more stringent regulations. Notwithstanding that Buderus and Rothschild were on such exceedingly good terms with the primate of the Confederation at Frankfurt, the fact that King Jerome's position in Westphalia had been seriously threatened caused the police at Castle to watch the movements of Buderus and Rothschild with renewed assiduity as they suspected them, not unjustly, of having financed the rising. This favourable opportunity was exploited by jealous rivals at Castle, who supplied of the police and their notorious chief, Savafna, with information. Moreover, Baron Barker, the accredited Westphalian ambassador to Dahlberg at Frankfurt, was a bitter enemy of Rothschild, and felt particular displeasure at the favour shown by Dahlberg to the Jew since he had long been convinced that Rothschild was in the elector's confidence in all the activities undertaken against the French. Savafna, who thought that a prosecution of the rich Jew might accrue to the benefit of his own pocket, concentrated all his efforts on inducing King Jerome of Westphalia to authorize the issue of a warrant against Mayor Emil Rothschild on the ground that he had been a channel through whom the elector's money had passed to the rebels. In this dangerous situation Rothschild appealed to Dahlberg to intervene on his behalf. Dahlberg did what he could, and it was only with great difficulty that the French police in Castle managed to obtain the warrant. A certain Levy, the son-in-law of a rival of Rothschild, informed Savafner as to the lines on which Rothschild should be examined regarding his business dealings with the elector. On May 9, 1809, Buderus was again arrested at Hanau submitted to searching cross-examinations, and was let out on substantial bail only after an interval of several days. On May 10 Savafna set out for Frankfurt with the warrant which he had at last succeeded in obtaining, but which authorized only a domiciliary search and a close examination of all members of the House of Rothschild. They had been warned in good time. The prevailing sentiment amongst the local inhabitants, both at Kassel and at Frankfurt, was one of solidarity against the foreign invader. It was only rarely that this feeling was subordinated to commercial rivalry. Mayor Emil was also given a hint by Dahlberg. He was particularly concerned about the elector's four chests containing account books which were under his care. They were in his house cellar, and he did not even know what they contained. As the cellar would naturally be searched he would have to do his host to rescue the elector's property as speedily as possible in the general excitement arising out of the sudden menace. Old Mayor Emil and his wife, Solomon and James, and the wives of the two eldest sons were at home. Emil, the eldest son, was staying with the elector at Prague, and Karl was travelling on other business. Those members of the family who were at home now tried to get the compromising chests through the connecting passage to the yard cellar at the back but they found that the passage was too narrow for the chests. These were therefore emptied, and their contents placed in other cases, together with some coupons representing unrealized obligations due to the firm itself. The family then set about the work of hiding the compromising account books and the secret records of the elector's intimate affairs, as well as certain embarrassing correspondence. When the Westphalian Commissioner of Police arrived on 10 May, 1809, 
furnished with his exceedingly limited warrant for summoning the Rothschild family and searching their house at Frankfurt, the most important documents had already been well concealed, and the individual members of the family had arranged between themselves what they would say when they were examined, so that they would not get involved in contradictory statements. Dahlberg, the sovereign at Frankfurt, had been watching the activities directed from Castle with a certain resentment. They constituted an infringement of his sovereign rights, and they affected a valued financier to whom he would soon want to apply again for a personal loan. On the other hand he felt that it would be exceedingly unwise for him to oppose the wishes of King Jerome's great brother. At the same time, for financial reasons it was only with reluctance that the King of Westphalia himself had consented to the issue of the warrant. It was therefore a foregone conclusion that the Rothschild family would not suffer any serious harm. Dahlberg also gave orders that one of his own police officials should accompany Savafner. The two commissioners accordingly betook themselves to Rothschild's business house in the Jewish quarter where the whole family were expecting them. Old Mayor Amel, who on this occasion too was unwell, was placed under arrest in his own room, while Solomon and James were placed under arrest in the office below under the guard of police constables. In the meantime all cupboards containing papers and business correspondence were sealed, and a systematic search of the whole house was instituted. Simultaneously the home of Solomon, who also lived in the town, was submitted to a similar search. Thanks to the advance warnings and to the well-concealed duplicate books, not much incriminating matter was discovered. The next step was to investigate the individual members of the family. Mayor Amel had to answer the questions drafted by the Jew Levy on the instructions of his rival, the banker Simon, at Castle, questions affecting the details of Rothschild's financial dealings with the elector. In many cases he replied that he had no recollection of the matters referred to, pointing out that he had suffered a severe illness and undergone an operation in 1808. He stated that this had had serious after-effects, and more particularly, that it had affected his memory. By this method of evasion he succeeded in avoiding making statements which the commissioner of police could have used as incriminating material. In these circumstances recourse had to be had to an examination of the other members of the family, including Mayor Amel's wife. The old mother replied that she knew nothing at all, as she only concerned herself with the house, never went out from one year's end to another, and had nothing whatever to do with the business. The two sons made the statements which they had previously arranged with their father, and in general said as little as possible. The examination of such books as were discovered yielded very slight result, as the incriminating documents had been removed. Mayor Amel cleverly used an opportunity which proffered itself, of lending Savafner three hundred dollars, and this helped considerably to expedite the conclusion of the official investigation. In any case, Savafner's authority was of a limited kind, and Dahlberg's commissioner, who was himself a Jew, was well disposed toward Rothschild, and used his influence to bring the examination to an end. As sufficient material had been collected to show that the action which had been taken was justified and necessary in the circumstances, the authorities at Castle too, were satisfied. Fortunately for the accused, Rothschild's enemy, Ambassador Barker, was not in Frankfurt at this time so that the whole painful business passed off well for the family of Rothschild. French reports on the matter reveal that the French officials found the Rothschild family to be exceedingly wise and cunning, and to have managed to secure friends in all quarters. The only positive result of the inquiry was to establish the fact that Emil Rothschild was staying at Prague and was directing the financial speculations of the Elector of Hesse and that the firm of Rothschild had made small payments to individual leaders of the insurrection. The only circumstance noted which was regarded as of graver import was that the brothers Rothschild had regularly paid considerable sums to the elector's consort, who was staying at Gotha, and to her business manager Kunkel, who also acted as an agent of the elector in promoting the revolution of Hesse against France. These facts in themselves furnished sufficient material for dealing ruthlessly with the family, if that had been seriously desired. But the Rothschilds benefited by the inhibitions of the rulers of Frankfurt and Castle, who at heart were pleased to have remained faithful to the elector, although they had maintained practical relations with the new French powers. Everything had resulted happily, and the Rothschilds could breathe freely.
but it had been a warning to act with even greater precaution in the future. The most important thing was to get the chests belonging to the elector out of the house at once, for in the course of another search the yard cellar might perhaps be discovered. The chests were therefore sent successively through the mediation of a Jewish friend to a business acquaintance of the Rothschilds at Darmstadt, a certain Abraham Mayer, and they stayed with him until the elector returned to his country. While these events were taking place at Frankfurt, Napoleon's campaign against Austria was proceeding. Swift as lightning, Napoleon's genius was thrusting down the Danube to Vienna. He sustained a reverse at Aspen, but on July 6 he made good this defeat by the decisive victory at Wagram. The elector at Prague had been anxiously watching the changing vicissitudes of the campaign. He had hoped that his tormentor would be speedily beaten and he now saw him coming ever closer to his place of refuge at Prague. When Napoleon was at the gates of Vienna, the elector was seized with terror. He would have to flee again, and in great concern he took counsel with his advisers, and with Emil Rothschild, who was staying with him, and who was no less terrified than his electoral master, as to whether they should not take refuge in the fortress of Olmutz. At any rate the more valuable articles were sent on there. Seven chests containing securities, and one containing jewellery were actually sent off. Then came Wagram. Napoleon advanced to Maron, and Olmutz was seriously threatened. The boxes had to come back, and the elector set out for Berlin, as the king had already offered to shelter him there. But the king now rather regretted having made this offer. Napoleon was too powerful and might resent the electors being granted asylum in Berlin. The king therefore wrote on January 29, 1810, to put him off, on the ground of management's delicates obtaining between himself and Napoleon at the time. Meanwhile peace was signed at Schoenbrunn, no mention whatever of the elector being made in the treaty. Napoleon returned to Paris, whereupon William decided to remain at Prague. The unsuccessful campaign of 1809 had resulted in the retirement of Count Stadion, the Austrian Minister for Foreign Affairs, and this brilliant man and bitter opponent of Napoleon withdrew for some years into private life. On October 8, 1809, he was succeeded by Prince Clemens Metternich, who was to play such a decisive role in the destinies of Europe during the following half century. Metternich had only just entered upon his duties when he received a letter from the Elector of Hesse, requesting the minister to support him, and to restore to his orphaned subjects their native prince, whose presence they so ardently desired. He had great hopes that Metternich would use his influence with the Emperor, and he was bitterly disappointed when he learned that he had not even been mentioned during the peace negotiations. He wrote a bitter letter of complaint to Stadion, so many worthless people relying on French protection, are unable to sin against me with impunity, and nobody now feels that he has any duties toward me. Everybody does as he pleases and is actuated by base and selfish motives. I have thus lost more than two-thirds of a fortune that was never very large. That is hard, but harder than everything else is my present condition. It was highly typical of the elector to suggest that he was badly off. In spite of his losses he was still actually one of the wealthiest princes of his time. But if there were spoils to be divided, he did not want to be left out in the cold on the ground that he was rich enough already. The money motive was always the principal one with the elector, and in this matter he had a perfect understanding with his crown agent Rothschild. Rothschild always advised the elector to ask concessions at every possible opportunity, as, for instance, that claims on him in respect of the troops should be waived, etc. And the elector got more and more accustomed to following Rothschild's advice, and scarcely took any important financial step without consulting him. A sum of £150,000 had been invested as recently as December 18, 1809, in 3% British consuls from interest received on behalf of the poor elector. The business in connection with this transaction naturally entailed voluminous correspondence, for the conveyance of which between Frankfurt and Prague Mayor Emil made himself personally responsible. He travelled in a private post chaise which contained a secret drawer. The French were anxious to intercept if possible the correspondence between the elector and his Frankfurt agents. Once they did actually succeed in seizing a letter destined for England which clearly revealed the fact that the Rothschilds were responsible for the management of the elector's funds in that country. 
In the meantime an important change had taken place in general European politics. The new personality directing Austria's foreign affairs had brought about a complete reversal of the policy followed previously. Nothing could be achieved against Napoleon by the use of force, and therefore Metternich tried other means. Napoleon's marriage with Josephine was childless. His union with an imperial princess would increase his prestige and might produce the heir he so much desired. The hitherto hostile states were thus reconciled by the prospect of a marriage, and in January, 1810, the Imperial House of Austria gave Napoleon to understand that if he asked for the hand of Marie Louise, the 18 year old daughter of the Emperor, he would not be refused. The contract of marriage was signed as early as 7 February. One of the first to be informed of this complete change in the situation was the Elector of Hesse. He immediately wrote again to Metternich to the following effect. I am writing to Your Excellency trusting to enlist your sympathy for my most cherished desires. The marriage which is to unite the two greatest monarchies causes me to hope that I may regain the Emperor Napoleon's goodwill, if our Emperor will but intercede in my favour. One word from him to the plenipotentiary of France will secure my happiness, and will at any rate establish me as ruler of one of the liberated states in Germany, even if I cannot regain my own penates. Surely that monarch will not be able to resist the intervention of his exalted father-in-law, and of an adored wife on behalf of a prince who has never yet understood how he has incurred his displeasure. The elector also repeatedly pressed Count Stadion to use his influence with the Austrian ruler in William's behalf. The minister had great difficulty in dissuading him from travelling to Vienna. Although in these letters the elector gave such a woeful account of his condition, he was faring exceedingly well at Prague. He had bought a palace on the clean site where he held court, and he maintained a household of thirty-six persons. He had also acquired the magnificent castle and grounds of Bibbenetch, which was finely furnished throughout, but with due regard to economy. The firm of Rothschild carried through the business matters connected with these purchases. The actual state of the elector's affairs was well known at Vienna. The financial affairs of the court and of the public departments were getting steadily worse, and the new friendship with France had done but little to lighten the burdens of debt incurred under the recent peace treaty. In the negotiations between France and Austria the Austrian Treasury official Nicolaus Barbier had been so vehement in his advocacy of Austria's interests that the French plenipotentiary on one occasion actually protested against his being present. This clever financial expert had played a considerable part in all the various loan operations which Austria had had to carry out during these wars. At that time the imperial state had no business relations with the Rothschild banking firm. There were four more or less official discount houses at Vienna, through which the Austrian government arranged its loans and other monetary business. They were the banking firms, Gay Muller & Company, Arnstein and & Eskels and & Company, Graf Fries and & Company, and Steiner and & Company. The Austrian government also dealt with the banking firm of Parish at Hamburg in 1809, in matters relating to remittances and realizations, such were the technical terms used at the time, of English subsidy monies. The condition of the Austrian state finances was lamentable. The value of her bank notes had fallen steadily during the wars, and the amount of paper money in circulation had risen to the enormous figure of over a thousand million gulden. It was already necessary to pay five hundred paper gulden for one hundred gulden in coin of the realm, this amount soon rising to twelve hundred gulden. In June, 1810, the difficulties had become so acute that an attempt was made to raise a loan of from two to three million gulden on the contents of the privy purse, which were deposited in the Vienna Treasury, this loan to be carried out by the four discount firms mentioned above, on the security of mortgage deeds. The banker Eskels made a journey to Paris and Holland in order to raise this money. It was also suggested that the state lottery monopoly should he mortgaged, but the four banking firms had not great resources themselves and were not particularly successful in their attempts to raise credits. Eskels was forced to report from Frankfurt that he had no hope of success, either in raising money or in mortgaging the state lottery. In these depressing circumstances Vienna remembered the wealthy elector of Hesse whom it had been treating so shabbily, and it was suggested that he might be persuaded through Rothschild to grant a loan to Austria. Barbier was entrusted with this mission, 
and discussed it personally with the elector, and also informed Rothschild of the matter. The elector replied evasively. He said that he must first discuss it with his advisers. And Budarus had pointed out to his master that so much money was already on loan with private persons that it was not desirable to make further investments. Rothschild also advised against producing capital sums of the amount required by the Austrian court, although he felt that it was not desirable to give the emperor a rebuff. The elector and Rothschild hit upon the idea of suggesting to the emperor that the elector should transfer to him all his individual outstanding claims, and that it should heed the monarch's own business to bring the debtors to book. He suggested that the emperor might have more influence and power to effect this, and that he might be able to neutralize any opposition of the French to collecting the debts. The advantage for him would be that he would then have only one single debtor, the Emperor of Austria. The elector accordingly wrote to Barbier that he would be happier than he could say if his royal and imperial majesty would take over the debts due to him, mentioned in the accompanying schedule. He stated that he was not in a position to grant a loan in any other way than that suggested, as eighteen months earlier he had purchased Austrian government stock of the value of over a million gulden, and funds in England had been sequestrated. If he recovered from his financial difficulties he would be delighted to be of service to His Majesty. He enclosed a list of thirty-three different clients who owed him sums in varying amounts, ranging from 784-848 reichs dollars down to 6951 reichs dollars. Apart from several princely houses, the names of privy councillors and councillors of embassies figured in these lists, as well as ministers such as Hardenberg, who owed the elector 140,000 thalers. The total value of all the claims amounted to the sum of 5,832,532 reichs dollars. This proposal however, came to nothing. The scheme put forward by Rothschild, and approved by the elector, had been too subtle and complicated, and on the instructions of Emperor Francis a reply was sent to the elector 49 declining the offer, on the ground that the collection of the money would be a process too difficult and uncertain, and not consonant with the dignity of the Austrian state. It was also pointed out that the monies had been attached by the French government, and that to accept a transfer of these obligations would therefore compromise Austria. Although the proposal was rejected, it had the important result that for the first time a high Austrian treasury official negotiated with a member of the Rothschild family. In the meantime important political changes had taken place at Frankfurt. Dahlberg's Confederation of the Rhine had exchanged Hanau and Fulda for Regensburg, and the title of Grand Duke of Frankfurt was conferred on the overlord. Dahlberg's promotion furnished an opportunity to Mayor Amor, who was in his favour, approving his gratitude to Budarus for his good offices in the past, by services other than financial. Budarus had been continually molested by the French police, and Rothschild decided to put an end to this by persuading Dahlberg to recognise the electoral official as a deputy of the estates of the Grand Duchy of Frankfurt on the occasion of the handing over of Hanau, and also to appoint him director of the Finance Committee of the Diet. He hoped that when Budarus held this official position he would be left in peace. Dahlberg acceded to Rothschild's request. He steered his course very cleverly between the former powers who were now in exile and the new masters at Frankfurt. It was very necessary that he should do so, for he could not uproot himself from the city of his birth. All his possessions were there, and the city was the principal commercial and financial centre of the continent. The Austrian ambassador Baron von Hugel reported enthusiastically regarding the increasing prosperity of Frankfurt, which had conserved its wealth through all the difficulties of the war period, and had actually grown richer. Luxury, he wrote, has increased incredibly. Cash is turned over much more rapidly. Hospitals, libraries, museums, etc. are provided on the most generous scale. Trade and industry flourish, and everyone is full of enterprise. Hugel emphasized the fact that the city already gave the impression of being one of the pleasantest and most important towns of Germany. The Grand Duke, he continued, takes an active interest in everything. Since I have been here, I have not seen a beggar or been asked for arms. The roses in the gardens are never touched, and in spite of all difficulties the industry of the tradespeople and bankers is exemplary. In fact their difficulties seem to act as an incentive to further efforts. During the last twenty years there has been no bankruptcy of any note. 
the volume of goods passing through the city is inconceivably great. Plutocratic standards obtain at Frankfurt, and persons are judged by the magnificence of their establishments or by the appearances that they manage to keep up. Hugel pointed out that Frankfurt was a focus for trade between northern and southern Germany, and the gateway to France and Austria, and that no less than 800 of its citizens had admitted to possessing unencumbered cash to the sum of 50,000 gulden or more, while some hundreds enjoyed annual incomes of this amount and upwards. Although this description may have been painted rather rosily, it was, in essentials, in accordance with the facts. There were many people at Frankfurt who had grown rich and the rapidity of the rise of the House of Rothschild to wealth and influence had been particularly marked. In view of the progress of his business, Mayor Emil now decided to define more clearly its internal constitution, and more particularly to regulate his son's share with greater accuracy than had been done within the framework of the existing concern. On September 27, 1810, a new deed of partnership was accordingly drawn up between the father and his sons. The main principle of this contract was that Mayor Emil gave all his sons a substantial share in the business in order to stimulate their industry. They became, not merely indirectly, but directly interested in its continued prosperity. To mark the change the name of the firm was altered to Mayor Emil Rothschild and Sons, and Rothschild conveyed this information to all his business friends in a printed letter in which he emphasized the fact that he was now associating his three sons with him in the direction of the business, which had been established for forty years. The contract assessed the capital value of the business at a total of 800,000 gulden, 370,000 gulden being allotted to the father, 185,000 gulden each to the sons Emil and Solomon, and 30,000 each to Carl and James, who had not yet conic of age. These shares were allotted to them as their absolute property, and it is noteworthy that Jacob, James, Rothschild, who was barely eighteen years old, was allotted shares to the capital value of thirty thousand gulden, as duly earned through the conscientious carrying out of the business entrusted to him by the old concern. For the purpose of dividing profit or loss, the business was divided into fifty shares. A multiple of five, having the convenience of facilitating the future division of the business equally between the five brothers, while the smaller fractions made it possible in the meantime to allot shares with due regard to the varying ages and capacities of the five sons. When the time came to divide up the inheritance, each son could acquire an equal fifth share. On perusing the document, one is struck by the fact that Nathan, who was living in England, is not mentioned in the partnership deed and seems to have been left entirely to his own resources, although he was in close business association with a parent concern and on the best terms with his family. Under the contract, twenty-four of the fifty shares were for the next ten years to belong to the father, twelve each to Emil and Solomon, and one each to Carl and James. In point of fact, however, Mayor Emil was holding the twelve fiftieths destined for Nathan. But for the sake of public opinion, on account of the French domination, the connection with Nathan, who was living in England, had to be kept secret. We may assume that there was a secret subsidiary agreement with Nathan, accurately defining his relation to the company. Each partner of adult age was authorized to sign on behalf of the firm. The deed recited that with the help of the Almighty, Mayor Emil Rothschild has, through the industry which he has shown from his youth upwards, through his commercial capacity, I. E. business instinct, and through a tireless activity continued to an advanced age, alone laid the foundations of a present flourishing state of the business, and thereby provided for the worldly happiness of his children. It was therefore laid down that the decision in all transactions should remain with him, as being the head of the business. Moreover, he expressly retained for himself alone the right to withdraw money from the capital of the business as he might think fit, whereas the other partners could take out only their annual profits and what was necessary for their households. It was also laid down that no daughters or children-in-law should have any right to see the company's books. Finally there were provisions against vexatious litigation, and any partner who set the law in motion was made liable to a penalty for doing so. Before he could appear before the judge he was required to deposit this amount. This article was cleverly designed to lessen the possibilities of disputes between the five brothers. And although they might perhaps have rendered it invalid at law, they fully appreciated its wisdom, 
and all five solemnly agreed to abide by it. The deed of partnership gives some insight into the varied nature of the business of the House of Rothschild, and the vicissitudes to which it was liable. As bad and unrealizable mortgages, debentures, and outstanding debts of all kinds are mentioned, it is clear that in its numerous undertakings the House of Rothschild sometimes suffered losses and made mistakes. These certainly always brought indirect advantages, as Mayor Amel continually emphasized to his sons that mistakes have an educational value, and one must never lose courage. Mayor Amel was careful to nurse the old connections which the Elector had facilitated for him through his relations in high quarters, and to exploit them for the benefit of his house. Whereas previously he had acted as the middleman between the electoral lender and Denmark, he offered as early as December, 1810, a loan of 400,000 thalers to Count Skimmelman, the Danish finance minister, which loan was to be advanced, not by the elector, but by Mayor Emil Rothschild and his sons. It was another step towards his gradual financial emancipation from the elector, although, having now arrived at the point of doing business on his own account, he continued to apply in his own interests the business principles so well proved by William of Hesse. Rothschild carefully watched the general political situation. Though by reason of his personality and origin, and his ignorance of language, he could not possess those qualities which are normally required in a diplomat, he had a sagacious understanding of human nature, entirely free of any preconceived ideas or prejudices. This was a particular advantage in a world which, at the time, was politically topsy-turvy. One really had to be a consummate diplomatist in order to carry on one's business without causing offence either to the French or to the powers which they were oppressing. As long as Napoleon's star was in the ascendant, the Rothschilds acted as if they were well disposed to France and her ruler. They lent money both to the French and to the native authorities, delivered flour to friend and foe alike, and hoped to be left entirely unmolested by Napoleon. They felt, as we know today, more secure than they really were. They were running great risks, for instance, in their commerce, or rather illicit trade, in merchandise with England. It was not till some time after the proclamation of the Continental Blockade that Napoleon realized that it inflicted hardship not only upon England but upon France, as France thereby lost her best customer, and the cost of living in that country rose much higher. He accordingly issued various decrees modifying the strict provisions of the Continental Blockade, so as to permit of a kind of official smuggling under departmental supervision, and also to allow the import of colonial goods on the payment of a very heavy duty approximating 50% of their value. In spite of these alleviations, smuggling was carried on on a large scale, and its direction was naturally concentrated in the commercial city of Frankfurt. Napoleon had sent his own spies there, and on receiving their reports he decided to take more active measures against Frankfurt. Budarus had just decided to give to the young crown agent, Karl Rothschild, who was about to attempt to bring to Prague the property which the elector had left in Schleswig, the final account for the year 1807, which the elector required. The official stated that he was not inclined to venture on the journey himself, because he was too closely watched and feared a further arrest, and the possible confiscation of all his property. His letter also contained news that would be welcome to his avaricious master. After long arguments, and as a result of great efforts, he stated, I have persuaded the crown agent, Rothschild, in effecting the third investment of £150,000 sterling, to charge one quarter percent less commission, so that he will deliver the stock three quarters, involving a saving of £4,521. The younger son of Crown Agent Rothschild will bring over the document relating to the first purchase of stock, as soon as means can be found for sending it safely. But this could not be carried out so easily. Napoleon's anger because Frankfurt did not respect his blockade regulations against England led to more stringent regulations, and Budarus was forced to change his plans completely. The Crown Agent, Coleman Rothschild, he wrote on November 2, 1810, should proceed to Prague at once, as several French regiments with artillery have come into the town, as well as a host of customs officials. All the gates have been occupied, and nobody is allowed to pass out without being closely inspected. All warehouses have been sealed, and an extensive search for English and colonial goods has been instituted, 
severe penalties being indicted when such goods have been discovered. The extent of the general confusion and distress which this has caused beggars descriptions. I myself have taken every conceivable precaution, and I feel justified in stating my absolute conviction that the sons of Crown Agent Rothschild deserve the highest praise for the tireless industry and zeal which they have shown in their devotion to your electoral highness. Fresh proclamations have been issued, promising a reward of 15% for information regarding the investment of your electoral highness's funds, and the number of spies and traitors under every guise is so great that it is impossible now to trust anyone. From this mild account of conditions here you may graciously be pleased to infer that it would be as impracticable for me to leave as it was formerly to transport the effects in custody at Godhall. I shall arrange for Crown Agent Coleman Rothschild to start as soon as it is possible to get a package out of Frankfurt. On instructions from Paris, a general domiciliary search for concealed English manufactured goods had been ordered at Frankfurt. The city which had just been described in such glowing colours by Hugel was now in a panic. Naturally the business house of Rothschild was also affected by this measure. A list was drawn up of 234 tradesmen who had to pay the heavy duties prescribed for the colonial wares which were discovered. Mayor Emil Rothschild was the 68th name in this list, and was made liable for a payment of 19,348 francs, which was certainly not a very large amount compared with the sums payable by other tradesmen. Herbin Street, for instance, paid nearly a million francs, and Bethman 363,000 francs. Altogether the French collected a total of nine and a quarter millions on the colonial stores discovered at Frankfurt. Half the amount payable by Rothschild was for indigo. In view of Mayor Amel's relations with the Grand Ducal government and his cleverness at concealment, we may assume that his actual stores of colonial goods were much greater, and that through his connections he substantially reduced the amount which he ought to have paid. Nevertheless this sudden incursion, personally ordered by Napoleon, had distinctly alarmed him. Meanwhile the elector at Prague had received Budoris's letters, and sent the following reply to his trusty official, It is a special satisfaction to me that you have induced the firm of Rothschild, in view of the prospect of a further investment of £150,000, to reduce their commission by one quarter percent. In view of further representations made by the Crown agent Rothschild, and having regard to the favourable price, I have decided to increase this investment by a further £100,000. But on the understanding that I shall pay this amount in instalments, and that I am not to be worried about it in any way. At the same time you are to see that the document regarding the first investment reaches me as soon as possible, and that I receive the others shortly afterwards. I note with pleasure that the House of Rothschild has shown its traditional devotion to me even in the present catastrophe at Frankfurt. You will kindly convey to them my satisfaction and gratitude. Meanwhile the Emperor of France had just experienced one of the happiest hours of his life. On March 20, 1811, Marie-Louise had presented him with a son and heir he so much desired. The baptism of the French heir, who had been created King of Rome while still in his cradle, was an occasion of unexampled splendour and magnificence. From all their domains, princely personages swarmed to the festivities, to take advantage of the opportunity of expressing their allegiance to the mighty monarch. The Grand Duke d'Alberg, in Frankfurt, also desired to go to Paris to do obeisance, but there was a formidable obstacle in the way of his doing so. The journey was very expensive, and d'Alberg could not visit Paris except with a retinue such as befitted his rank. But he had no retinue, and in the first instance he turned for assistance to the Association of Frankfurt Merchants requesting them to lend him 80,000 gulden for the journey to Paris. The merchants, who disliked the Napoleonic regime, and could not agree as to the proportions in which the money should be subscribed, declined the request. Dahlberg had not applied to Rothschild in the first instance, because he thought the amount was too heavy for a single individual to advance. Mayor Emil learned of the Grand Duke's wish, and voluntarily offered to advance him the sum at 5%. Dahlberg could now proceed to Paris. While Rothschild had always enjoyed Dahlberg's favour, this clever action gained for him the full confidence of the Grand Duke, as is indeed specifically stated in a later French police report regarding the Rothschild family, seven through meeting him in this matter he was so successful in gaining the Grand Duke's confidence, 
and secured himself so thoroughly in his good graces, that henceforth the Grand Duke scarcely ever refused him any request. He asked for instance for a passport for young James, who was then nineteen years old, and who was sent through Antwerp to Paris, straight into the lion's mouth. His presence was necessary there in connection with certain illicit business that Nathan was carrying out from England, which will be described in more detail later.